This is the third Sunday after Pentecost here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The epistle is taken from St. Peter, our first Pope, chapter 5. Dearly beloved, be ye humbled under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in the time of visitation, casting all your care upon him. For he hath care of you. Be sober and watch, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goeth about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist ye strong in faith, knowing that the same affliction befalls your brethren who are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto the eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little, will himself perfect you and confirm you and establish you. To him be glory and empire forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Luke, chapter 15. At that time, the publicans and sinners drew near unto Jesus to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. And he spoke to them this parable, saying, What man is there of you that hath a hundred sheep? And if he shall lose one of them, doth he not leave the ninety-nine in the desert, and go after that which was lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, lay it upon his shoulders, rejoicing, and coming home. Call, calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep that was lost. I say to you, that even so, there shall be joy in heaven upon one sinner that doth penance more than upon ninety-nine just, who need not penance. Or what woman, having ten groats, if she lose one groat, does not light a candle and sweep the house, and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the groat which I had lost. So I say to you, there shall be joy before the angels of God upon one sinner doing penance. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So a few days ago, in this, uh, this is the month of June, and a few days ago was the great feast of the most sacred heart of Jesus. The sacred heart of Jesus is the, what would it look like if God could show us his love? What would it look like if God could manifest his love to us from the Most Holy Trinity. And he answers that question. Firstly, he answers it in the very works of creation. Because all creation shouts the glory of God. All the Psalms repeat this frequently. How magnificent are thy works, O Lord! How beautiful are thy ways! Because all creation glorifies thee. The whole order of the universe the whole order in the seasons, the whole order in just one human eyeball, the whole order in the nature of things, how God makes the chickens give us eggs, which are, which are perfect size for cooking, oranges, perfect size for eating, apples, God made everything, and milk, just enough milk, not too much that it would spoil, not too little that can't support a family, but just enough. So God's wisdom, God's ways in his creation already shout his glory. But that's, that's not enough because the, all creation, of course, has been wounded, as it were, by sin, by the fall of our first parents. 
So creation, of course, creation can't sin, but the stain of sin can harm creation. And so St. Paul says that all nature groans now. It groans until the redemption be accomplished. Because God made all the universe to glorify Him. But sin brought in disorder. Sin brought in the, the disordered cacophonic sounds in the symphony of God's creation. It was sin that brought in this chaos, pain, fighting, suffering, and disturbance of every sort. And so grave was this that God already once had to punish the world, punished it severely by the flood. And the flood wasn't just rain falling from the clouds. It was the fountains of the deep bursting, splitting the continents. The whole earth was in total catastrophe. And the whole fossil record, rather than showing that the mankind and animals and plants are billions and billions of years old, which is absolute stupidity, <coughs> but rather shows the proofs of the flood. The flood, the, the fish caught in the very act of trauma with their fins open and their mouth open. Some fish are caught frozen in ice, eating another fish suddenly. Some of the woolly mammoths, when the, the, continents, when the continents shift and they got frozen in the, the mud of ice, in icy mud, they've got still plants in their mouth they were chewing in a tropical, beautiful jungle, and now they're completely shifted to the cold regions. So, in a sudden way, and frozen in ice. So, these, all this shows man offended God, and God punished the earth already once. But even after the punishment of this earth, it still shows the beauty and the glory of God. And this is, the earth is so beautiful in all its creation, and yet, it was already punished. So, creation does not yet show in its full capacity the glory of God. And that will be, St. Thomas Aquinas says, on the new earth. When, the, when this earth has been purged on the last day, purged by fire, as high as the flood of Noah reached above the mountains, so the fires will purge the entire earth. And there will be a new earth on which the saints will dwell in the heavenly Jerusalem, always seeing the beatific vision. And this earth, says St. Thomas, will be far more magnificent than the one we're in now. It will show forth the glory of God forever. And, well, let's just hope we're there to see that. And not in the middle of the earth, roasting forever. But we're going to be on one in one of those places. And that's why... The Catholic faith is so important. That's why to save our soul is the most important business of all business. The glory of God, says St. Bernard, is the preoccupation of all preoccupations. So everything must be ordered to that, to His glory. So, but, what would the love of God really look like if He could do it in a, in a personal way? And He's done that also. On the moment of March 25th, in a humble little town of Nazareth, as children were playing in the streets, and the markets were going on, buying and selling, and people walking and talking, and the carpenters, maybe even St. Joseph, who was thinking to get married, to do God's will. He was probably working on a project, God knows. But it's on March 25th, in that little village, that the eternal God came down, sending the angel St. Gabriel. When the Virgin Mary said, Fiat, let it be done unto me according to thy word. And she openly accepted God's will, knowing that this acceptance to be mother of God would be for her to be truly mother of sorrows. She knew that. She accepted it. And at that moment, God became flesh. At that moment, the tiny little heart of Jesus 
started to pump. And that little heart of Jesus, and this detail is actually brought up in this encyclical Herent Animo, Harietis Aquas, rather. You will draw waters from the fountains of the Sacred Heart, written by Pope Pius XII. It's an excellent encyclical on the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And in there, he makes that very point, that in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the love of God took on human form. And already that heart was pumping in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And all his blood, all his heart, all his internal organs, all the development of his body took place in the nine months in the womb of the most pure Virgin Mary. She was sinless. Christ was God who had no sin. So this perfect, this perfect body formed in Our Lady and that heart, those hands and feet, which came to be brutally crucified. That was the first reason, says St. Thomas Aquinas, God became man. It was because sin brought down the Redeemer. Not that he wants sin, but he loves souls, and he doesn't want souls lost. So he came not for the just, but for sinners. And who are the just? Who are the the 99 sheep that are just. These are the angels, says St. Gregory the Great. These are, the, these are all the billions and billions of angels that chose God, that humbly obeyed God, that did not rebel against Him. And many of the saints say, including St. Thomas, that the big test for the angels was that they would sometime in the future have to adore God who would become flesh in our Lord Jesus Christ. And Luther said, Lucifer said, and Luther, but Lucifer said, I will not serve. I will not adore. I will not bow down before a hump of clay, even if it was God. So he led the rebellion and St. Michael in the great battle of heaven drove them out. And they were cast into the eternal fires of hell. And there are millions and millions of devils. St. Bernard and St. Thomas say that there are far more angels that God created on the first day, far more than the number of men from the beginning of the world to the end. It far outnumbers. So St. Bernard even says that the end of the human race will be when the gap, that the gap formed by the fallen angels is filled. And then will be the end of, of human history and the final judgment, and the final separation of the human race. So, the 99 sheep that don't betray our Lord are the angels. And the one lamb that goes off and gets, gets ripped up and caught in the thorns, and maybe even stuck in the thorns, and the wolf starts coming around. And that is the fallen human race. Because we are all we're all sinners. We're all born in sin. We're all born children of wrath, says St. Paul. And what made us children of God, not just in name only, not just a name tag, but really in the essence of your soul, what make, transforms our soul from black coal to a living trinity, a, a temple of the blessed trinity, where he lives, where he dwells as in a home in our heart. Where this is done by sanctifying grace, and this is miracle takes place, this transformation of the soul by baptism. And if lost by mortal sin, it is recovered by that great sacrament of mercy of confession. And confession really shows the love of the Sacred Heart because he really lives his own words to St. Peter. When St. Peter thought he was being extraordinarily generous, Lord, should I forgive my neighbor seven times and then punch him out after? And then our Lord answers and says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven times, meaning always, always forgive. And our Lord does this, doesn't he? Every time we kneel down in confession and confess our sins, every time we turn to him sorry for our sins throughout the day, 
and make an act of contrition every night, our Lord forgives. He loves to forgive. And <clears throat> so that one lost sheep that He rejoices over is us, poor fallen human race. And nothing gives more glory to God than when we humble ourselves before Him and ask in His mercy and repentance for our sins. He told St. Margaret Mary, to whom He reinforced the devotion to the Sacred Heart. It wasn't new. The devotion to the Sacred Heart was not new in 1689 when He appeared to St. Margaret Mary. It wasn't a new devotion. That devotion, as Pius XII also defends, that devotion to the Sacred Heart goes right to the very beginning of our Lord's incarnation in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Then that heart, when He was born in Bethlehem, that heart was pumping strong as a little baby. And then when, ch when the child Jesus grew in the hidden life from infancy to boyhood, boyhood to manhood, manhood to his public life beginning at age 30, <coughs> the heart of Jesus always pumped for the love of souls, for the love of his Father. Every single sigh, every single act, every, every single action of our Lord was what, what theology calls a theandric action, that is, a, an action of God himself. And, and everything he did was for the love of souls, love of us. And one of the little things that St. Gertrude, Gertrude used to do, who was twin sister to St. Mechthild, and our Lord appeared often to both of them, and then to her, to her also, he showed the love of his heart. And that was uh, 200 years <coughs> before he appeared to St. Margaret Mary. And she would, she would do this every night when she went to bed, and every morning also. She would say, Lord, and during when I sleep, I can't love you. When I sleep, I can't pray to you. I can't think of you. So, I, when I'm sleeping, I offer you every heartbeat of my heart, in union with your heart that beat on earth, and your mother's heart, out of love for you. And our Lord was so pleased with that, He took that literally, every beat of her heart, was an act of love. He took it in that way. Because God looks at the purity of our intentions more than our actions in many cases. And this is why we should have a great purity in our intentions and in all we do. Imitating our Lord Himself who came for the love of souls to glorify His Father, to satisfy the justice due to sin, but mainly also outweighing the justice to show His divine love. So here's what, here's what uh, Pope Pius XII says, speaking of the heart of Jesus. The infusion of this divine charity also has its origin in the heart of the Savior, in which are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. For this charity is the gift of Jesus Christ and of His Spirit. For He is indeed the Spirit of the Father and the Son from whom the origin of the Church and its marvelous extension is revealed to all the pagan races which had been defiled by idolatry, family hatred, corrupt morals, and violence. And, and we're going right back to this again, pagan ways. <coughs> and then he goes on to say how the divine love in the heart of our Lord is the source of all graces. Here's what he says. This divine charity is the most precious gift of the heart of Christ and of His Spirit. It is this which imparted to the Apostles. It is this which was imparted to the Apostles and martyrs, that fortitude by the strength of which they fought their battles like heroes till their death in order to preach the Catholic truth of the Gospel and bear witness to it by the shedding of their blood. So remember, one of those apostles was St. Thomas. And all the apostles wept for betraying our Lord. 
but all of them also touched his wounds. And like St. Thomas, all of them touched the wound of his heart. And they saw the right side of our Lord gouged with a huge gouge open and could see his burning heart inside. And how many times our Lord appeared to his chosen souls <coughs> showing the wound of his heart and the heart with the gouge in it on fire circled with thorns and with the cross on top. And this repeats itself in the great image of the miraculous medal after whom this chapel of Philadelphia is named Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal and on that miraculous medal is shown the two hearts the burning heart of our Lord and the burning heart of our Blessed Mother so those two hearts are the source of all graces <coughs> excuse me <coughs> and he continues It is this heart of Jesus giving us his spirit of the Holy Ghost. It is this which implanted in the doctors of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, St. Albert the Great, etc. The great doctors of the church, their intense zeal for explaining and defending the Catholic faith. And St. Thomas, he, he is such a gift for the human race. St. Thomas Aquinas, the Summa of Theology, and all his writings are such a gift from heaven. Because they even, he wrote them in the 1200s. And he died at age 49. And St. Thomas, in his kind of short life, he had written such a treasure that all his works refute heresies. It already refutes Protestant heresies, refutes iconoclasm, iconoclasm which smashes all images, statues, because they misinterpret the first commandment. And he already refutes every heresy. He already smashes the modernness of our time. And St. Saint, Saint Thomas X will say that St. Thomas Aquinas is the remedy against the modernism. And for the average Joe, it's the catechism. For priests, clergy, and and those who go deeper into the study of the faith, it's St. Thomas, the Summa of Theology. And for the average Joe, it's the Catechism. These are the defenses against modernism. Because modernism attacks the simplicity of the Catholic faith. And this is what's defended against by the great doctors of the Church. And that's why St. Pius X had put in the Code of Canon Law of 1917, not the, not the foolish new code, heretical new code, but the old code. It's a command, it's an actual command that St. Thomas must be taught in the seminaries and not just his doctrine in general, but also his method. Very important. And St. Thomas, of course, defends everything in Scripture, everything in Catholic tradition. And among them being the six days of creation, which the modernists love to attack. The six days of creation and all the miracles of the book of Genesis. He defends them. So these great doctors, what inspired them to love the faith, defend the faith, write to defend the faith, was the love of the Sacred Heart and the Holy Ghost poured out to them. So, our Lord gives us these great treasures. He gives us today His own heart. And in confession, He pours out to you the love of His heart. And as long as we're in the state of grace, He dwells in us. And should we lose the state of grace, He, as long as we're on this earth, He longs for that such a soul to come back to His heart to be washed in His precious blood. So, what moves these doctors and saints and apostles was the, the love of the Sacred Heart and, the, and as our Lord said when I go to the Father I will send you the paraclete. I will give you the Holy Ghost who dwells in your soul with the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. And this is what's called sanctifying grace. <coughs> the Pope continues <coughs> This nourished the virtues the Sacred Heart and the Holy Ghost 
nourish the virtues of the confessors and rouse them to those marvelous works useful for their own salvation and beneficial to the salvation of others both in this life and in the next. Who are these great confessors? St. John Bosco, St. John Vianney, St. Joseph Cafasso, and thousands. There's, th there's so many confessors that we honor throughout the church year, and many who are not honored publicly in the, in the church. But many confessors, what moved them to love, to labor for souls? The love of the Sacred Heart, who burned in them the love for the love of souls. This finally also moved the virgins to a free and joyful withdrawal from the pleasures of the senses and to the complete dedication of themselves to the love of their heavenly spouse. Who are these virgins? St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, St. Catherine Labore, St. Gertrude, St. McTeel, St. Scholastica, St. Angela, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of the Child Jesus, St. Bernadette, all these beautiful virgin souls who loved our Lord. So what moved them was the love of God, the love of souls, the burning heart of Jesus burning in them. It was to pay honor to this divine charity, which overflowing from the heart of the incarnate word is poured out by the aid of the Holy Ghost into the souls of all believers, that the apostle of the Gentiles, St. Paul, uttered this hymn of triumph, which proclaims the victory of Christ, the head of the church, and of the members of his mystical body, over all which might in any way impede the establishment of the kingdom of love among men. And St. Paul breaks out with this beautiful adoration of Christ the King. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or persecution, or the sword? But in all these things we overcome because of him that has loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor might, the one world order being established, which will unleash a, a physical persecution on the church. Now for 50 years we've been undergoing a moral persecution, which in some ways can be worse than a physical persecution. But even all this, nor things to come, nor might, modernist Rome crushing tradition, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is what burned in the heart of Archbishop Lefebvre. And he had a great love of God, a great love of Christ the King, and a great love of souls. He also, his greatness was this. He had a great love for the Church, for the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And that's what he thought of. This is so important because I might say it's a manly way of thinking. Because a man thinks objectively. He thinks of his family in relation to the city. While the mother God built, she, her place is the home. And she thinks of her family. She thinks of her children. She thinks of the kitchen. She thinks of pleasing her husband, which is her duty, and obeying him. She thinks of her relatives. She thinks of this, which is also very good. God built them for that. But it's in the man's realm to look at the good of the whole city, the good of the whole nation. And Christ established a pope to be a man, not a woman, to look after the whole church. And that's the duty of the popes. And when we have good popes, of which there have been mostly good popes in the history of the church, they do such incredible good work. One good pope has been such a blessing. Just think of the influence of Pius X. He saved the whole church from 75 years of modernism. And they still couldn't come back except in a sneaky way and then triumphed at Vatican II. So one good pope so a man's job 
looks over the good of the church. And Archbishop Lefebvre, being a prelate of the church, a bishop, and seeing the church on fire by Vatican II, he saw, I can't just be worried about my little bedroom, the Society of St. Pius X, and just get our little recognition and our little crumbs from Rome of being allowed to say the Latin Mass and being allowed to have our seminaries and being allowed to have our schools and priories. He saw that's not enough. The whole house is on fire. And he fought for the church. And he said to the Holy Father and to the Hall of Rome, modernist Rome, Rome is in darkness. Rome is in the grip of neo-Protestantism, of modernism, in the darkness of the, the satanic grip and Freemasonry. And he called a spade a spade. And he named out names of rats. He named them. And why did he? Because he loved Mother Church. And he saw the whole church on fire, and he had to defend the whole church. And the only remedy, as he told the four bishops that he consecrated, who have ever since kicked him in the teeth, asking the Pope to lift the so-called excommunications, and, and, this, and then that letter, which is in the recusant of May this year, May 2018, you can read that letter. Now, I never read that letter until recently, and I, I just can't believe the bishops, including Bishop Williamson, fell for this. Because the letter says explicitly, this shows greater union with, with Rome. And which Rome? Modernist Rome. And the modernist Rome is what Archbishop Lefebvre always fought. Because that's the Rome that's destroying the true Catholic Rome, the true Catholic Church, to which we belong and we stay with. But what happened? We being modern men, we easily become feminized in our thinking. And that's the trouble with most men today. They become feminized, not just in their mannerisms and in their thinking, but in their whole thinking, in their being, they're being feminized. And that's a program from the enemy. That's a definite desire of the enemies of Christ. But Archbishop Lefebvre thought like a man and thought and loved the church. But Bishop Follet thinks more like a woman. And, and I'm not saying this in mockery, but it's just the fact. He thinks effeminately. Because he's turning to Rome, please grant us the crumbs of recognition, so that we recognize as we are. Give us our living room and our bedroom in the, in the house. But the whole house is on fire. You've got to be worried about the whole house. But he's just begging, let's just have our bedroom, our, our living room. And that's, that's feminine thinking. And it's destructive. And Rome has no problem granting crumbs. They've granted crumbs to Campos. They had all these wonderful deals. They make the deal with Rome. And they fall to modernism. Busy in the apostolate. And not picking up what was really going on. And the three things that show the preparation for this betrayal was the letter of gratitude for the releasing of the Tridentine Mass, which was not a release of the Tridentine Mass at all. It was more of a blasphemous equating of the Tridentine Latin Mass with the new Mass. That's what the Pope Benedict's Summorum Pontificum was about, putting the truth Mass on a level with this Masonic Protestant service. And that's a blasphemy. So when, Pope, when Bishop Fillet thanked the Holy Father for this, it was, it was wrong. Archbishop Lefebvre would never have accepted that. And in the cover letter to the motu proprio, it says, all the priests who say the Trinitarian Mass must accept, must accept the new Mass as the ordinary form of Mass. And the extraordinary one is the Trinitarian Mass. But the ordinary form is the schismatic new Mass, and we're thankful for that. Bishop Follet was thankful for that piece of trash? No way. So that was the first major collapse. Second major collapse was when the four bishops asked for the excommunications that never existed to be lifted. And as the letter of this bishop says, this shows greater unity with Rome. And of course, modernist Rome. And Bishop Follet 
Bishop Tikalaraza, Bishop Tissier, and especially Bishop Williamson should never have signed that. They should never have signed that. Because that excommunication was a badge of honor in the eyes of Archbishop Lefebvre. Why? Because it, it separates us from this destructive church of Vatican II and the conciliar religion. We don't want anything to do with that. So that was the second big fall. And the third final collapse and the triumph of Vatican II within the Society of St. Pius X, certainly among the leaders, was the 2012 doctrinal declaration, which accepts Vatican II in the so-called light of tradition, accepts the new mass, new sacraments as legitimately promulgated, accepts the new code, accepts religious liberty of Vatican II, and the decree on ecumenism. And this is the death of any congregation Already 13 buried alive, and now the last was the Society of St. Pius X. Very tragic, very sad, very lamentable. And then ever since, now they're teaching new doctrines. One of the priests of the Society uh, glorifies the theology of the body of John Paul II. Another priest of the Society in St. Mary's got up in the pulpit, blessed by the superiors, because he preached at all the five Masses, so it was definitely endorsed by the higher-ups, pushing NFP in an indirect manner, but pushing NFP and telling the faithful it's not a race to have children. When Christ, God, in the book of Genesis, three times, the order is very clear, three different commands in the imperative, in the plural, in Latin, Christomini, multiplicomini, and replete, Fill the earth with children. Have the children God sends. And, and this idea of NFP and mocking it, like Pope Francis mocked it in Philippines. You don't need to multiply like rabbits. What an awful thing from the mouth of any Catholic gentleman, let alone the Pope. And then, and then, um, <clears throat> and then last summer, the... Father Skippy, hearing the vows of a marriage. A novice auto priest, hearing the vows of the young couple. And then the Society of St. Pius X priest saying the Mass after that. There, there's already, you already have liturgical ecumenism right there. And then Father Paul Robinson, a, t a teacher in the seminary of the Society of St. Pius X in Australia, promoting in his book, which was promoted by all the SSPX bookstores, <laughs> promoting this horrible stupidity, let alone lie, and false doctrine of evolution. How is this possible? And even professing that the Big Bang is true, which was a... <laughs> it's so ridiculous. And it was invented by a French priest, Father Joseph Metra, who, promo who pr promoted and propagated this Big Bang idea. But the Big Bang defies logic and reason. How can you say all this order of the universe and the over, over a million operations in the human eyeball alone, right now in both our eyes, there's millions of operations going on. So that if one structure of the eyeball fails, the whole eyeball fails. So there can't be an evolving of of the retina, and then the evolving of the color rods, and then the evolving of the, of the, of the, of the tear ducts. That can't all evolve in different times. Otherwise, the human ball could, human eyeball could not evolve. It defies reason. And let's say there was squids and everything in the primordial soup. Where did the squids come from? Where did the first gases that collide for the so-called Big Bang idiocy? Who made those gases? So the, the whole thing just defies reason, defies, and it definitely goes against Catholic revelation that God revealed in the book of Genesis and all of Scripture. And Pius X nailed these criminals in the Biblical Commission and in the Pascendi and Lamentabile and Prescentia Scripturae. He nailed them and ordered them out of the seminaries, out of the universities, and made all the clergy and, and professors in Catholic schools take an oath against modernism. So this is going on in the Society of St. Pius X. Where are the priests to publicly burn this book? Where are the priests of the Society to stand opposed to this false teaching? 
and let alone the doctrinal declaration, and let alone the ongoing compromise and collapse of the once strong Society of St. Pius X. So let me close with some sound teaching coming from Archbishop Lefebvre. He says this, We are not in schism, and never forget that. We of the Catholic resistance, of the Society of St. Pius X, the one that Archbishop Lefebvre founded, and of Catholic tradition of all the popes and all the councils before Vatican II, we are not in schism, period. We stay Catholic. We are the continuators of the Catholic Church. It's the ones who make the novelties that go into schism. The new Mass, new Vatican II heresies, who are in schism? Those who follow that. Of course, we pray for Pope Francis, come back to tradition, because he's going to have an awful hell to burn in, an awful hell, because he's taking so many souls to hell with his little, little corrupt phrases and joking phrases about God not being Catholic, and it's okay to be G-A-Y, and it's in all this perverse, all these little sentences that overthrow Catholic teaching. What a shame. And uh, Grandma told me that uh, Patricia Murphy, before she died, I mean, Pauline Murphy, before she died, she said uh, she was the one to tell me that there was a boy in St. Peter's, like little, uh, well, they're sleeping, but uh, a little boy in St. Peter's with his hands folded, praying at the Mass, or praying during some prayers in St. Peter's Basilica. And Pope Francis was walking up, he saw the boy with his folded hands, and he rebuked him. This is, you don't have to be a plastic statue to pray. Something like that. And, and of course, we, we know Pope Francis mocks the rosary, mocks those who, traditional Catholics, who count their prayers and mocking that. Of course, we don't count our prayers, but we pray the rosary, as Our Lady asked. So, who are in schism? Those who bust up the church with false heresies. Archbishop Lefebvre again says, This anomaly in the church did not come from us, but from those who tried to impose a new orientation on the church, an orientation contrary to tradition and even condemned by the church's magisterium. If we seem to be in an, ab seem to be in an abnormal situation, it is because those who have authority today in the church burn what they once worshipped, the Latin Mass tradition, burn once they, what, what they once worshipped, and worship what, what was once burned. Worship pagan idols, Pope John Paul II allowing Buddha on an altar, worship the Lutheranism, worship all these false religions by ecumenism. It is those, says Archbishop Lefebvre, who have deviated from the normal and traditional way that will have to return to what the church has always taught and always accomplished. How can this be done? Humanly speaking, it seems that only the Pope, let us say a Pope, can restore order destroyed in all areas. But it is better to leave these things to providence. And then Archbishop Lefebvre concludes saying, Our identity would be drowned in this heterogeneous whole. Our testimony to Catholic tradition would be, would be compromised, and we would have betrayed Christ the King. What interests us first is to maintain the Catholic faith. That is our fight. Then the canonical question, being recognized, being settling the question of, you know, diocese and who, the schools. Then the canonical question, purely external, public in the church, is secondary. To be publicly recognized is secondary. We must not seek the secondary by losing what is primary, what is the first object of our fight. In other words, we must not put the things of the faith second. They're always first. And that defines what God wants of all of us now. To be Catholic, to save our soul, we must profess the faith of all time. And that means a lot of sacrifices, tons of sacrifices. Because you can't go to your local Navasoto parish, obviously. You can't even go to your local 
Latin Mass because it's part of the whole modernist soup. You can't even go to your local SSPX Mass because they're now part of that modernist soup by the doctrinal declaration and the ongoing compromises. So what are we left with? We, you got to stay with priests who keep the true faith and the true Mass with no compromise. And that's, I hope it increases. Pray for the society priests to wake up because many do know better. Most of them know better. They've been trained in the, in the old traditional way. Pray for them. And last but not least, pray for our seminary in Kentucky. Pray for the boys, uh, the seminarians who will take their final exams this week, written and orals. So do pray for them. And may the Sacred Heart of Jesus, who you receive very soon in communion, burn in you. Burn off the rust of sin. Burn off the old ways, the old Adam, and infuse in you a great love of God, that you run in the sweetness of God's love in His commandments, and uniting your tears with His, uniting your thorns with His, uniting your grief and your sorrows with His. He knows all that. He knows it far more than we do. And also unite all your joys with Him, and all the blessings that He gives you every day, thank Him and grow in that love and adoration until we finally get to see him home in heaven. Which joy I wish you all through the Immaculate Heart. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs>